Francisco. Alan Watts has written a book that Nancy Wilson Ross in the New York Times Book Review has called A Work About a Phenomenon Filled with Enthusiasm and uh, I might add the juiciness of life and the phenomenon of course is the author himself Alan Watts who perhaps more than anyone in this country perhaps in the western world has helped popularize but in the good sense uh, the nature of Zen and Mr. Watts written about oh, 20 or so books Way of Zen his most uh, popular among others his, the newest is about himself his autobiography it's called In in My Way. In, in my, my own, own way. way. In my own way and own. <laughs> you know, Alan, I was thinking, before I let you loose and you go off talking, as you will, in a very marvelous way, we hear you do Onion Chant. This is a recording some years ago that I have. You and your friends in a spontaneous happening. And the question I must ask as we hear this is, how did a good English boy come to do this we're about to hear? Be natural. The onion chant, the voice of you, it almost sounds Arabic, it could be Hebraic, it, uh, it, uh, Buddhist perhaps, I don't know, but here are you at the very beginning, this recording made some time ago, uh, Alan Watts, uh, from a uh, middle class uh, English town, Chislehurst, some miles out of London, and you talk about trying to find out who you are, basically is what it's about, a search, discover who you are. Yes. I'm thinking about this particular chant. That was you yourself chanting. That's right. At the right, beginning yes, you were saying yes, how difficult yes. it is. Yes, I love to chant. It's uh, Everybody should sing. It's as good for you as exercise, running, sexual intercourse, vitamins, proper diet. Everybody should sing. But the trouble is we hear so much recorded music of real talented singers that people say to you when you sing. Why are you making that horrible noise? What do you, makes you think you have a voice? <laughs> but I'm thinking this, this chant doesn't seem to be British. That's what no. I'm to. We've come back. Oh, this no, is your autobiography no. in no. my own way, no. see. See, uh, all, all uh, talented Englishmen have gone away from England. And that was the real origins of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. That they were terrified of the climate, the cooking, and the 300 <laughs> boring religions <laughs> that the English practice. So all talented Englishman left England. <laughs> well, your book, of course, uh, your book and the 2021 20, or so other ones concern religion, of course. Religion well, you must remember, life. you see, it was Voltaire who said that the English had 300 religions and only one source. That was it. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about the 300. You, you've gone through quite a few yourself. Now, you became uh, an Anglican priest here yes. at Northwestern University right. some time ago. And it's the road you travel. We have to go back to the beginning, how you became the Zen apostle that you are, that seems removed from your own culture as this young English kid. And, uh, we, perhaps we could begin at the beginning. Your father writes a preface to it, and he admires you very much, his way of life, and you, in your own way, live different lives. Yes. Well, my father was partly responsible for it, and so was my mother. My mother taught at a school where missionaries abandoned their daughters while they went to convert the heathen mm -hmm. in China mm -hmm. and India and Africa. And when they returned as uh, thank offerings for taking care of their children, they gave her uh, glorious works of Chinese embroidery and pottery. And so as a small boy, I, had the, I was surrounded with these. And then my father used to read me stories from Rudyard Kipling, the Jungle Books, the Just So stories, Kim, and Kipling was a very strange fellow because although most people think of him as a jingoist, he was one of the major sources through which the high culture of Himalaya uh, came back to the West. And people began to inquire into Buddhism and uh, Hinduism and the things about which he wrote. It was this background, this is the beginning, there was an open door for you as far yes. as your mother, as far as reading is concerned. But you speak of a sort of an, even though the climate was that of what you would describe as fundamentalist Protestantism, you were aware of colors. You yes, speak of because colors. We, 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 our family was Church of England, that is Anglican, and it was not Baptist or Methodist, and uh, our churches were very ancient and beautiful, mm -hmm. and they weren't uh, sort of scrubbed tabernacles. But there's a marvelous uh, uh, observation you make in your book, in my own way, about the Anglican Church so sure it's right 
Yes. So sure, it's absolutely right. That now and then it allows eccentricity. Yes. You could, it's, the most, it's the most liberal of all forms of Christianity because so long as you abide by certain basic rules, you can be anything from a Quaker to a Theosophist to a uh, Papist. But that liberalism, that openness, <laughs> also had the base in a certain arrogance, and that's absolutely positive. It oh, right. yes. Yes, when I was, I, after all, carried the Archbishop of Canterbury's train at his enthronement. You did. As a small boy of uh, 13. Uh, it was Cosmo Gordon Lang, the one who dethroned Edward VIII. And uh, uh, you know, I, I was in the very heart of the Church of England and brought up there and I declared myself to be a Buddhist at the age of 15 but all they reacted was Anna's jolly what the man's a Buddhist <laughs> <laughs> the question is now the question can come to Alan Watts and his curiosity how come you declared yourself to be a Buddhist at the age of 15 this is, this is well because I it. found the religion I was being taught uh, w was extremely oppressive and uh, I really didn't like the image of God the Father that was being presented to me. It was authoritarian and bombastic. And the way the clergy, uh, the kind of voices they used to read the scriptures and to say the prayers, I felt to be completely ridiculous. So uh, I happened to discover the writings of Lafcadio O'Hearn about Japan. And uh, I had always been interested because of the oriental art around home, and so I knew a lot about China and Japan, but when I discovered his writings and his descriptions of Buddhism, I was enthralled. I thought, my goodness, uh, here is some tremendously intelligent way of looking at things. Instead of listening to people go on, Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture be with us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess their manifold sins and wickednesses. You know, and all that stuff. So, <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, this is all of one piece, really. Because at the beginning we heard just a fragment of the onion chant and your preface in which you were saying how difficult it is to find the real person. In your autobiography, in this book, in my own way, that I'm delighted to see Pantheon, a very perceptive house, is publishing, <laughs> that uh, Chislehurst is the town you remember, and the people in it, you remember with a great deal of fondness, and they wanted to be connected with nature. This is interesting. You found, I noticed I, have, I made a note here, people in nature. You found them wanting to be connected with what was happening and growing around, but the religion they were practicing sort of disconnected them. Yes. I always felt that the religion they were practicing was disconnected with the natural universe in which we lived. It's as if um, no one would attribute a composition by Bach to uh, the Beatles or Shostakovich. Different styles. Mm -hmm. And I felt that the style of whoever it was that was being worshipped in church was completely different from uh, the style of whoever it was that had uh, caused the birds, the bees, and the flowers. Yeah. Also, you, see, you speak of rituals. I suppose someone said ritual is the opposite of true religion. The rituals of ablutions, the rituals of going to the toilet, the rituals of prayers and hymns, etc., and all the rituals of furniture, too, and their non total use. I well, suppose you dwell on that because this concerns your boyhood in, in this town. Yes, I, uh, I like ritual, but I, it's style, and as uh, Proudhon, I think it was, said, le style c'est l'homme, the style is the man. And uh, I don't do rituals or have anything to do with them because of the belief that they will work magic for me. But just for their elegance, like one would sing or dance. Ritual is a form of dancing. And Americans, I discovered when I first came to this country, seemed to have abandoned ritual. When I first came here, I used to dress very correctly. I wore a black Homburg hat, carried a neatly rolled umbrella or a cane, and gloves. And the immigration officer at Montreal, where I came through to the United States, he said, What do you carry a cane for, you sick? I said, No, I carry it for swank. And mm -hmm. he said, Ah! <laughs> he was really a very nice fellow. But I found as I came, I thought that Americans were very natural, whereas the British were very affected. Mm -hmm. But then I discovered that American naturalism was an affectation. That's an affectation, too. And it's a ritual. 
So we can't avoid riches. Can't, you can't you avoid say. it, no. But the question is, uh, I'm thinking about the early days you're talking about, how you were told you must do this or you must do that. Something that R.D. Lang, yes. whom we both admire, right. opposes so much. The must do something. And therefore the, the chance oh, of the yes. person to be natural becomes unnatural. To yes, result. because that is what we all put over on our children, whether we be Europeans or Americans, is you are required to do that, which will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. Yeah. And that's a double bind. Yeah. It's like saying you must love me. Mm. And so if I say to my wife, darling, do you really love me? And she says, well, I'm trying my best to do so. Mm. It's obviously not the answer yeah. that I want. <laughs> this thing, of course, uh, Nats is about, R.D. Lang and yes, all his approaches. Nuts, about. Yes, We come to you, but we come to the double aspect. The name Alan itself, Alan Watts, and you go into, in, into the source thing. That's a double meaning, Alan, doesn't it? Yes. It means in Celtic harmony. And in Anglo-Saxon, it means a hound. So we have in man, then, and in you, using... Yes, the <laughs> if we can use this phenomenon, <laughs> Alan Watts is our metaphor. In you <laughs> are both. Yes, mm. because it's always been my feeling for life that uh, a human being is a coincidence of opposites. I am, on the one hand, extremely interested in religion and the mystical because ever since I can remember, I found the universe absolutely amazing. The fact that I existed at all seemed astonishing. But at the same time, I feel that a person who is, has these interests should also be sensuous. And that religion has no business excluding the sensuous aspect of our lives. Uh, in being so uptight about sex, for example, and uh, down on it. Uh, so I, I regard uh, my own life as a kind of, um, I have a foot in both worlds. I have a foot in the sky, as it were, and a foot very much on the earth. You speak of this very point, uh, the foot both places, the two aspects of man. If you repress one, by the very nature you must pervert man. Yes. I think you, you mentioned the wondrousness, the astonishment that you look for. On page 184, in my own way, you speak of God. Perhaps you should read it, you know, this last paragraph. It's about the, uh, the approach to God, how people approach God one way, others another way. Well, I say the word God is more of an exclamation than a proper name. It expresses astonishment, reverence, and even love for our reality. If you want to put a human face on it, that will do if you don't take it literally. Since we know nothing higher or more mysterious than people, and an energy field which peoples can hardly be less intelligent than people. Certainly, events happen in the field, that is, in the universe, which seem absolutely horrible, but faith is the gamble that there is some way of understanding or at least accepting them, and I do not see what at other attitude a sane person can take. Well, there, I mean, the idea that, by God, the phrase we use, mm -hmm. by God, it's an exclamation. Yes. He also could be a furious one, or it could be God. It could be one. Yes, one of, one of absolute awe and astonishment. And so we come to the question of, of uh, approach toward God. He, she, it, you, I might be. Or oh, this, why toward Buddhism? One spot you speak of the religion with which you were raised, mm -hmm. the Anglican. There's a God who's uh, he's there, powerful at times, vindictive the Old Testament God to some extent is times vindictive, uh, times punitive, you know. And you're looking for something else. Yes. And so on with Christian soldiers is militant. You yes. were mentioning that. Whereas Buddhism is something non-militant. Yes. Yes, well that was the point of dissension, uh, that I didn't go along with the militant religion. I thought it uh, unnecessary. If God is God, to show all this armed might was a sign of weakness because the trouble was that the biblical God as understood was patterned on the ancient kings of Egypt and Persia and Chaldea and uh, a king who rules by violence is necessarily afraid and therefore puts on a lot of bombast and requires that people who come to court kneel down because that's a difficult position from which to start a fight kneeling down. And so I felt that uh, that was a show of weakness. 
and furthermore that a god made in that image was even more idolatrous than a god fashioned in wood or stone or brass because the most dangerous idols are not made of material but are made of imagination or conceptual thinking so uh, Buddhism although I'm not a missionary for Buddhism this must be understood I don't give myself today any religious label oh this is funny you know when you get a form to fill out and it says name address age sex and some people write yes under sex <laughs> so in the same way if I had a, a entry to fill in religion I just write yes because I'm tremendously interested in religion but at the same time I don't think partisanship in religion is intellectually respectable now you see Buddhism is sometimes called atheism but that's incorrect it's not that Buddhists believe that there is no God they don't believe in any particular conception of God any particular idea because they feel that's like trying to uh, grasp water in your fingers or to uh, catch space in a net you can't do it or uh, another analogy would be it's like trying to bite your own teeth because you are it we have a philosophy which we've inherited from uh, most of the Western tradition that we as people are not really related to the universe we say I came into this world now we did nothing of the kind we came out of this world in just the same way as say um, a baby comes out of a womb or an apple comes out of a tree and the apple therefore shows something about the nature of the tree and so the human being likewise shows something about the nature of the universe the universe is doing us ah so if uh, so <laughs> if we can follow the uh, fact the traditional Western approach is we came into this world that is though one were not part of it yeah. whereas if I follow you correctly Buddhism would say we came out of the world and are in it the connection of nature and man being one and yes. the connection rather than disconnection right and this is particularly true of another Eastern philosophy which we call Taoism uh, Chinese uh, which is underlies uh, all sorts of things like judo the gentle way rolling with the punch going with the stream the realization that to sail a boat is more intelligent than to row it yeah. going with it always yeah. you know it's interesting your, your friend Joseph Campbell who is in your book a uh, great uh, mythologist man of myth Joseph Campbell uh, recently and was mentioning you too but was talking about the difference between Eden as Genesis, Western world has it, and Eden, uh, if it's called that in Buddhism, in the, when the discovery of knowledge was made, Adam and Eve were driven out of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Buddhism, they're part of it, they're taken into it. Yes. He's written a great deal about this particular problem. And uh, he points out that the division of the world into the positive and the negative and the male and the female in Genesis it is the creature that is split and not God whereas in the tradition of the Hindus God splits and becomes all this that's very funny God splits so we yeah. use a slang word too splits he takes off too yeah sure yeah. he says to himself man get lost what yeah. would you do if you were God yeah. you know if you knew everything all possible futures all possible pasts and you were absolutely in control you would find it very boring it would be like making love to a plastic woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you would say, get lost. Mm -hmm. Go into an adventure. Mm -hmm. Forget who you are. Mm -hmm. So coming back to the beginnings of, of, these, of the autobiography, in my own way, you call it. And we'll ask you about the, the village you lived in or the town, Chislehurst. And it's, really, it's endearing. You, you, you find the people, you, you remember them endearing. In my own way has its, a special meaning, doesn't it? It has Title two meanings. meanings. It is, of course, to do something according to the way you like to do it. It's also to get in your own way, to uh, obfuscate yourself, to obstruct yourself. And uh, we all do that for the same reason that I was just now explaining, that if you were God, you would get in your own way. In other words, you would uh, find being completely in control of everything, being completely competent, total poor. And no nothing adventurous would start. 
unless somehow or other you could get in your own way <laughs> or stumble. And so the Hebrews say that when God created Adam, he put into Adam the Yedzahara, which is the wayward spirit. See again, the word way, mm -hmm. wayward. Mm -hmm. And uh, I call it the element of irreducible rascality. And I, can't, I find it very hard to relate to people who are not aware of this in themselves. Uh, if, uh, people I really like have a certain glint in their eye, which indicates that they're not entirely uh, perfect. <laughs> well, perfect, and that perfect <laughs> would be... Do I have a glint? Yeah, you uh, sure do, Stutz. <laughs> 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 uh, I guess being perfect would be being plastic, I suppose. Being perfect, whereas having both, having the Mephistopheles as well as the uh, the Faust or the other guy, whoever he might be, up, wherever. I don't know why he's always up or down, perhaps is part of man. Both yes, of course it is. And so the challenge is there. Yes. This is what your, this is what your autobiography this is This is really what I'm saying, yes. Yeah. And I'm also saying <clears throat> that I realize that as a personality uh, who's in the, before the public eye, Alan Watts, uh, I'm a bit of a fake. Maybe a genuine fake, but still I know that behind the front that I present to the world there's a good deal of scotch tape and wire and string and the stuff that holds it together. And I say to the reader, and I say this, to give you courage to go on with your show, because you know very well that you've got a lot of wire and stuff holding it, <laughs> holding the scene together, <laughs> and that you're not entirely what you look like on the outside. And even this very moment, this is very fun because uh, you you speak of the show business. Even you use the very phrase itself, show yes. business aspect of what you're doing. Even you and I, right now, uh, using this, the, uh, these microphones, you and I, right now, are playing roles, aren't yes, we? Yes, of course we are. Yeah. We're in showbiz. Yeah. And uh, the, this, uh, but all life is basically mm. showbiz. It, the whole universe is, as you look out at it at night, a fireworks display. Well, we send up fireworks on the 4th of July and so on because we want to celebrate. And so in this way, the entire universe is a celebration. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, R.D. Lang, I remember, uh, since both of us admire him, uh, in the politics of the family, he's, he's quoting Sartre. Sartre watches this waiter, and this is probably what you're talking about. He watches this waiter, and the waiter is, has a certain way of walking, you know, mm -hmm. and talking. And suddenly is this waiter is playing the role of a waiter. Yes. That the fantasy may be as real as the very actual thing, or the actual, or the physical thing he's doing at that moment. He, too, even, he's not really a waiter, you see. I tell the story yeah. of a boy I was friends with in school who was going to be a clergyman. And he was so set on being a clergyman that he smoked a brand of tobacco called Parson's Pleasure mm -hmm. and had already cultivated the mannerisms associated with clergy. And uh, we, we all do this in various ways. Uh, I know I retain my English way of talking, even though I live in the United States. It's somewhat a corrupted English accent. But I find that it's of enormous advantage That's to me to do so. Very funny you say this. Often you find someone from the South uh, maintaining a deep South woman or man. Mm -hmm. Deep South is oh, that's charming. You know, they say whatever they, they they think they think what they and it's an act. Now by this time, even uh, the great black work singer Lead Belly, uh, Richard Dyer Bennett, is a marvelous yes. friend of Lead Belly, says, "Why do you retain?" By this time, Lead Belly lived in New York long enough. Yes. Well, been in Northern, but he still kept a deep. South, seemingly illiterate accent. Mm -hmm. Lead Belly had gone beyond it, but mm -hmm. he, in his own mind, not consciously, but he maintained it, you see, because it gave him that exotic quality in this other land, you see. And so a Southern Belle in Chicago uh, she almost refuses to lose that Southern accent. Sure. So well, you're talking about your British accent. I feel the same way about uh, Oriental people and Europeans. When they speak English with an accent, it has a tremendous charm. And I never correct them unless they make a mistake that is uh, outrageously misleading. But uh, they should always retain the accent. And English spoken with an accent. Uh, after all, everybody speaks English. Yeah, but why should accent. they always... Uh, here's a question. <laughs> why should someone retain an accent that will become unnatural for him to retain if by a certain time he has lost it? Not to lose the roots, to get this kind of the roots he came from. 
but isn't the maintaining well, of something see, deliberately. That, that gets us down to yeah. what we mean by natural. Mm -hmm. And that's a very complicated philosophical question. Uh, I have given up trying to be natural because uh, I really don't know what it would be. Uh, I live in America. To be natural here, what, should I speak like a Hopi? <laughs> or what? <laughs> or like Middle West? Or like I came from Boston? Or like Los Angeles? Say Los Angeles? And uh, so on. I don't know. Yeah, so we come to a big question of who decides? Who decides what is natural? It's is Lang's question again. Mm -hmm. Who is the psychiatrist? Who decides this right. man is a schizophrenic? Exactly. Yeah. In a society at the moment, the very, I suppose, to shout and holler at this moment might be very healthy rather than the silence. If the society itself might be somewhat uh, mad in nature. Well, of course, I, I take the premise that everything is natural. Although that really doesn't mean or say very much. Because if you say anything about everything, then people wonder what you were saying. This is the deepest problem of philosophy, because to say the whole universe is the expression of God is uh, perfectly meaningless from a logical point of view. So we're really talking about step by step, aren't we? We're talking about not, not to be a specialist, to be, I like the word generalist, been used enough, to have an idea of, or try to have an idea of what it's all about, but we have to talk then about specific moments and issues, don't we? Yes. Right? Rather than... Yes, because all words are like boxes we do say are you male or female are you a democrat or a republican are you a tinker tailor soldier sailor rich man poor man beggar man thief and what class do you go you see all words classify but we know although we can't really say that there's underneath all classes something which we call existence and we only understand existence by contrast with not existence mm -hmm so that we can see intuitively that both existence and not existence are the positive and negative poles mm -hmm. of something we can't think about at all because it is us and we can't bite our own teeth and so we cannot conceive what we basically are. But some people have got onto it that there is that and therefore they're not afraid of death because they know that's just the negative pole in now you see it, now you don't is you is or is you ain't mm. well you have to be ain't to be is mm. you wouldn't know that you were alive unless you'd once been dead well uh, we, can come <laughs> no, no, we can also come to something else you know isn't there a certain kind of death while still breathing we come to that oh too. that's yeah. another yeah. use of the word right yeah. yeah let's take a slight pause for a moment alan watches my guest and his newest work is is a very joyous a very juicy autobiography because it's about himself <laughs> and about the world as he sees it. Pantheon of the Publishers will return in a moment. We're resuming the conversation with Alan Watts and the subject his autobiography is. The latest book is 22nd or so and it's um, in my own way. It's a book of death. Uh, when uh, John Brown was hanged, uh, Thoreau offered a sermon to his parishioners at Concord. There were that Sunday parishioners. He says, this man is dead. We know he's dead because he was alive. He lived. Very few people die because in order to die, you first must live. And very most of us run down like a clock, he says, and leave eulogists mopping up the spot where we left off. We tell a quest. So we're talking about being alive as a requisite a prerequisite to dying. Well, like being married is a prerequisite to getting divorced. <laughs> <laughs> but also being dead is a prerequisite to being alive. Well, we, uh, could, could, could you uh, explain that? Well, now imagine. Uh, ab abandon all wishful thinking mm -hmm. and ask what would it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? Supposing when you're dead, you're so dead that it's as if you had never existed at all. Not only you, but everything else. Complete, total blank. When you think about that for a while, and you realize that's the way it was before you were born. And what happened once can always happen again. Yeah, but don't you see, here's the point. You, there was no consciousness before you were born. No. You know. But isn't the very consciousness itself and being there, isn't, doesn't, I hate to use that word looking for a meaning, but 
when one is alive, as you and I at this moment yeah. apparently are, I say apparently yeah. are, we, do we, yeah, how's that go again, that, that uh, question? About the man dreaming was a butterfly, or is he a butterfly? Oh, this was the was Chinese a, yeah. philosopher Zhuangzi, who dreamt mm -hmm. he was a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And when he woke up, he couldn't make up his mind whether he was a man who had dreamt that he was a butterfly, or whether he was a butterfly dreaming that he was a man. Right, so here we are now. Apparently, you and I, at this moment, are alive and breathing. Yes. Doesn't this have a special, even during this period, the span, whether we live to be 70, 75, or less or more, uh, doesn't this have a special sort of attribute to yes, it. Yes, of course it does. It's what we call reality. Beingness. And we know it by contrast with its opposite. All knowledge is a matter of contrast. And uh, so uh, as we go back in our memories and trace them and trace them to our earliest childhood, there comes a place where it fades out. And we realize there was a time when we were not. But out of that not came something. You have to have nothing in order to have something just as you have to have space for there to be stars. And the space is black and the stars are bright. And the stars come out of space just as sight comes out of your invisible head. <laughs> <laughs> and now a question. Now a question. Uh, you're describing what might be called the human condition, the eternal condition, the universal condition. But isn't there something, and perhaps you know, something called the social condition, that while one is breathing and alive, it came out of nothingness, there is somethingness, isn't there an excitement of some sort to try to, whatever it is, deeper and deeper to life and Im improve, as it, I hate to use a word, improve, but to make more fulfilled what your life is by the very nature, since obviously we're connected to someone else, to make the world itself more fulfilled in some small way. Yes, there Specifically, I mean, as far as uh, politics, anything. There are really two basic ways of doing it, it seems to me. One is to become as finite as possible. That is to say, to get involved in desperate situations, as in falling in love, as in war, as in adventure, where you get your kicks by losing control, by being in danger. And being in love is being in great danger, yeah, but you see? That's now, one way. Yeah. Now the other way is waking up to discover that you're not in danger at all, that you uh, substantially are the eternal source of the universe, and that you will go through all sorts of transformations, but there's nothing to worry about. And therefore, in this way of understanding, you're able to live life with a certain um, detachment uh, you're able more to play it as a game than to live it as something serious so you don't take yourself seriously G.K. Chesterton made the remark that the angels fly because they take themselves lightly and I always love that remark yeah, maybe was. angels may fly because they take themselves lightly but we are not angels no we are uh, not exactly angels but uh, the, the no, indeed we're not. Uh, because we are both, aren't we? We're both angels. Both devil and, and angel. Yes, so we come back to the question of detachment. How can one be detached? Shouldn't be a combination of detachment and passion both? You can. I th would think that uh, the, the greatest people in the world could be very involved, but be what we call, we used to call in England, a good sport. And that is that if you lose, you aren't uh, depressed. You, you take it all as a game. And you don't have to say to yourself all the time, you must win. Ah, we're talking about winning now. I'm, I was not, see, we're talking about winning. You, you're putting on, this, on the basis, Alan, of winning and losing. Yes. And I'm trying to think of something else at the moment. And well, that is, let's yeah, say yeah. That there are a lot of people who play the stock market. Mm -hmm. Now, you're going to get ulcers if you take that seriously. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be a good player on the stock market if you take it lightly. Yeah, but I want to come back to that theme because we left it hanging about uh, while we're here, whatever span we spend on Earth, you, I, millions of others, we hope, each of us does, I assume, we hope that it better, whatever that means, a better world, or our lives are more fulfilled than they can be. And so the question is, 
how can one play it as a game mm -hmm. that will and be, be detached mm -hmm. without in any way becoming passionate about something, becoming involved about something, whether we think it's injustice or rightly or wrongly, fighting for something. And that's not just winning or losing. We're talking <coughs> about, not, I don't mean a mean competitive spirit. I mean the nature that we're connected one way or another to the other person. Well, I have, I'm inclined to feel that most of the troubles that go on in the world are created by people who take life seriously. Uh, and therefore they can't forgive. They must have what they desire. Uh, they regard it with excessive urgency. And uh, if they didn't take it so seriously, they wouldn't make so much trouble. As we have the proverb, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Do you think Mahatma Gandhi took life seriously? Yes, much too seriously. I regard him as a violent man. And he created a new nation, which we could have well done without. Nations being divisive. If uh, he had uh, done something to bring the whole world together as one people, and not create a separate nation, I would uh, regard him more favorably. What was that nation before Mahatma Gandhi came along? Well, it was a subject nation of the British. Ah. And the British uh, were guilty about it. Should they, they or shouldn't they? Well, they, they felt a little bit guilty. Well, they should knew they very well they? they'd exploited the, the Indians. And uh, I don't think that certain other nations would have felt so guilty. And so Gandhi was able to get away with it because of the British guilty conscience. You think they should not have felt guilty? I think that uh, that's a... Let's ask another question. Oh, no, I'm asking, <laughs> you, I'm asking you about Mahatma Gandhi. No, no. We come back to the question of... No, uh, I think the, the British undoubtedly were, were, were guilty for exploiting India. And uh, that, uh, that they, at the same time, when they began to realize what they were doing, they did a great deal of good for India. Although uh, they infected India with Puritanism, and um, Lord Macaulay, when he devised the educational system for India, did it with the deliberate intent of destroying Hindu culture. And he really was terrible. He mm -hmm. was a very, very bigoted fellow. I, I want to return to Mahatma Gandhi. I know there was, as I know that. Uh, Eric Erickson writes from others, and he, he himself in his, in his works, and Romain Rolland, that at the beginning he was a great deal of violence and uh, sensuousness, which he repressed perhaps, but the non-violent movement that he instituted, do you think has been for evil rather than good? Gandhi's idea of non-violence. I don't think it was true non-violence. Gandhi was a stern moralist. He was against sex. He was a Puritan. He was a disguised Christian. He wasn't a true Hindu. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back. So I'm thinking now about uh, what, a, what about the nonviolent movement itself? And we have to come to that. Ah, well, Gandhi, you know, nah, because you speak of Buddhism, thing. the nonviolent aspect early in your book, in your biography, as mm -hmm. against the onward Christian soldiers yes. and militant approach. Yes, right. So don't we come back to, d didn't Buddha take life seriously? He took it lightly. He certainly didn't take it seriously. He took it. I would make a distinction between being sincere and being serious. If a girl says to me, I love you, I don't say to her, are you serious or are you just playing with me? Because I hope she isn't serious and that she will play with me. I say to her, are you sincere or are you just toying with me? So I feel that Buddha's attitude to life was uh, very definitely the light touch. And getting people liberated from feeling that one absolutely must survive. When you feel that, you see, survival is a drag. If you have to go on. Uh, Confucius put it beautifully. He said, a man who understands the nature of life in the morning can die with content in the evening because he's liberated from feeling that he absolutely must go on. 
And uh, when you don't feel like that, you have more energy. In contrast, say, to Samuel Beckett's people. Yes. Who feel, uh, who are waiting for Godot, or who are mm -hmm. part of Endgame. Yes. Life is a chore. Yes. But you go on. Mm -hmm. You're saying uh, that in, in the Beckett people, and it seems the world is somewhat Beckett-esque at the moment, yes. you know, there's something missing. And what is missing is what? What is missing is that, uh, is that what? That well, to put it in the simplest possible yeah. terms, which are not quite correct, yeah. but they'll do. What is missing is that we don't, we have a mistaken sense of identity. We don't realize that each one of us is really the whole eternal universe expressing itself in a particular way. Uh, in the Hindu scriptures, in the Upanishads, there's the saying in Sanskrit, tat tvam asi, which means roughly, you're it. So, but being more, <laughs> somewhat more secular minded than you, Alan watches my guest and uh, his autobiography is marvelous reading. <laughs> you might find points in which you might diverge, you might take another path from me. He says, in my own way, his own way, need not be my own way, because I'm a little bit more secular than you. And so I raise the question of how can one, how can one, living a certain span of life, return to this theme again, uh, living in a world, real or unreal, fantasy or truth, uh, find life more fulfilling in every way, where creatures we, there are creature comforts or discomforts. There is tremendous inequity in the world. Uh, do you see, you think it should go, that this is the way it is and it must go on? We can return to Gandhi and India and British colonialism. No, no, you no. See? You ah. see, I'm in a way a social activist. I'm tremendously interested in the reform of prisons, in uh, reform of the police. Uh, I get furious about certain kinds of injustice. Uh, but I feel that I can be effective in that kind of work only if I know that basically it doesn't matter. If I get involved in a cause where I feel that it absolutely has to succeed and that I would almost commit suicide if it didn't, then I feel I can't work effectively for it. I will show my hand as if I were playing poker and I were going to bluff this through. Now, if I'm nervous about losing my shirt, I can't put on a good bluff. But if I'm not nervous about losing my shirt, <laughs> I can put on a perfect bluff and get away with the game. And that's why I feel that a certain spirit of a sense of eternity in yourself, mm. that doesn't mean everlastingness, it means beyond time, yeah. knowing that you are one with the Godhead. Uh, as Jesus knew it, and as uh, Ramakrishna and all those people knew it, Buddha. Uh, you, if you have that internal sense, then you can get immersed in uh, helping people and doing things, but without the motivation which makes one always do the wrong thing for the right reasons. I mean, I often think of the foreign aid program of the United States as, as an example of, kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. Yeah. And uh, all, the, all this war that we're waging in Vietnam is uh, absurd. I mean, if we were go in that war, in order to possess the territory and carry off the women, it would have some sense to it, because then we'd be sure that neither the territory nor the women were destroyed but we are waging it for purely abstract reasons uh, which show how little we live up to our claim to being materialists. Now, I don't know if they're abstract <laughs> reasons. We consider the people abstract. It's true that the that those, the intellectuals and the ideological think reasons. of it ab in abstractions, which is the horrendous yes. aspect. So it's the abstraction you find the horrendous thing. Yes, because you can't have a fight about abstractions because it means that one side is good and the other side is evil and therefore there can never be a gentleman's agreement. Uh, so when we fight between ideologies as between capitalism and communism or between uh, religion and uh, paganism. But Alan, we can't get away from the thing that, you see, if one is not afraid of losing one's shirt, when someone does not have a shirt to lose, it becomes a wholly different 
game, if I use the phrase. And so we come back to Asiatic countries, African countries, all the internal indigenous horrors may be there. At the same time, something is happening. A gentleman's agreement is rather difficult at times when the belly is empty. And therefore, if changes are occurring, yes, to stop those absolutely. changes is unnatural. It would cost us less to fill all their bellies than to fight the war. What we've spent on war collectively since 1914 would have uh, all that wealth and energy would have fed the whole world and everybody would have been comfortable. Yeah. This is by way of going round and about your autobiography. All this is in it in one way or another. Uh, you speak of your own university, uh, how the various people you met influenced on your life. In the very beginning you influenced, mm -hmm. the beginning of your mother and father. Then you speak of the various people you met. And you have some very funny stories about Aldous Huxley and others. And yes. Well, Huxley has the glint, doesn't he? Yes, very much so. He was an extremely civilized man. And... Uh, he had a beautiful voice. He seems to say it's most extraordinary <laughs> to consider fashions in medicine. Do you realize that fashions in medicine are just as much as in clothes? Why not so long ago? It was fashionable to have one's whole large intestine removed. The only trouble was with the operation, it was immensely expensive, that people had to go to the toilet like birds. <laughs> and now this operation has been entirely abandoned and nobody has heard of it anymore. <laughs> I'm imitating yeah. his voice. <laughs> and, <laughs> this is and, the way he talks. And so <laughs> when he talks, where the, could be at lunch anywhere, there's an immediate, now we come to something, don't we? Yeah. There's immediate listening by nearby table. All Not knowing who he is, yes. but there's somebody yes, unique. somebody unique. And ah. all, I remember in a, a restaurant in San Francisco, uh, where he was holding forth on uh, new methods of advertising on television, which was subliminal, mm. so that you didn't notice the advertising was going on. And he described the potentials of this for political horrors. And uh, he absolutely, the whole restaurant fell silent listening to his conversation. So it doesn't, sometimes, it's, we're not talking about precisely what he said, but the very fact someone very alive yes, was there. Right. And I suppose people are seeking this, aren't they? Oh, yeah. The sense of life. Sure. That you, Alan Watts, have, though I disagree with <laughs> a number of things very much. We come back to sense of life, don't we? Yes. <laughs> and this is what in my own way is about you met you met Krishnamurti huh? oh yes yeah. I know him quite well now I'm thinking about I was young you were young too when I first heard of Annie Besant yes and the, well see I suppose we have to ask question here's Annie Besant of the western world what made someone like her seek out Krishnamurti well uh, she was um, thrilled with her discovery of Indian religion and with the idea that there are divine people living and moving among us, our masters, as she called them. And, uh, and this is, I mean, a matter of course to Hindus, that there are people who are awakened, who are Christs, even from birth. And this fascinated her very much. And she uh, wanted close association with one of these. And she looked around and she found this obviously incredible boy and uh, made out that he was the new messiah. But the funny thing about Krishnaji is he, do, he did just what a real messiah would do, and that is he renounced the office. And uh, <laughs> therefore everybody said, well, sure, he must be it because he behaved accordingly. <laughs> you know, Alan, I'm thinking, as you're laughing, there, there is this gnawing question. If there are so many Christs in India, you, like if, if I could just switch, switch gods around and about, mm. a god like people around and about, so many messiahs in India, how come the situation is so rotten for the great many millions in India today? Well, don't forget, this is an extremely ancient civilization which has been exploited by conquerors for uh, 500 years, first the Muslim invaders and the British. Everybody exploited India. And so I don't think it's uh, quite fair to say that the Indians are where they are because of their attitude to life. Not <laughs>